Friends Podcast. Hi, I'm Diane Hunt. I am an Impressionist Realist Painter connecting with nature through my brush. I work in oil paint and watercolor and I live in the countryside of Maryland's eastern shore, not far from the Chesapeake Bay. You can find me online at dianehuntstudio.com and on Facebook and Instagram at Diane Hunt Studio. Hi, I'm Constance Brosson of Steve Brosson's Jewelry Designs. I live in Oklahoma on a prairie, and I make uh, handmade jewelry in silver, copper, and brass. I'm an artist that paints. I paint pastels and in oil sometimes. Hello, this is Clyde JKL. I'm the host of this podcast. I am a emerging representational artist. I do historic rend- renderings, seascapes, landscapes, botanicals, birds, and whatnot. The tight illustrated pan and watercolor, tin and ink, and acrylic paints. And I live in Oklahoma City. And here we are again. It is Monday, August the 17th. My name is Clyde J. Kale, and you are listening to the Artist Friends Podcast, episode 59. And I am here with my two best artist friends, Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson. Hello, Diane. Hi, Clyde. Hi, Constance. Hello, everyone. Hello, Constance. Hello, Clyde. Hello, Diane. Hello, everybody. All right. Hello, folks, and welcome to the broadcast. Okay, this week, I, I watch a lot of YouTube videos, especially when I'm working on art or whatever, and uh, art-related type videos, and uh, especially art history documentaries, because basically I just like history. So this week, I picked out a, uh, a couple uh, videos that were uh, art history related. One of them was, was a video about uh, exploring America's most famous artists and it's yeah done by the uh, I guess the BBC or an English uh, organization at least the narrator was a uh, a presenter was an English English guy and it was really interesting and uh, went through some of the uh, more famous American artists and uh, a little bit about about uh, their works and what kind of motivate them and uh, Diane, Constance, you two get a chance to watch that video? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, what would you think about it, Diane? We'll let you go first. Um, most of the people he talked about, um, I wasn't really a big fan of. <laughs> but um, there, are, there, uh, there were quite a few artists in America that um, really did have impacts on me. And... Um, they had like the um, Hudson School of Pain- Painters and um, Mary Cassatt. Um, there was there was a few others, but uh, it, what he was talking about was really interesting. How they a lot of them came from other countries into this country and brought you know what they had learned from their countries here, and it all kind of melded together and <laughs> turned into something different. So it was, it, that was interesting to see how that happened. Like, how they brought different aspects of um, what they had, what they knew from where they were into the American culture. Were there any of them that he mentioned that you've never heard of before or? Uh, no, I, no, <laughs> yeah. I knew all of them. Constance, what about you? Did you, did you find, find the documentary interesting? I did find it interesting. Um, 
I found it interesting that he thought that he the the New York City kind of reminded him of the Grand Canyon and that he he was interested in the artists who followed this Russian lady who had started her own sort of religion and that they had used that following as a stepping stone for their art sort of um yeah she had gone to india and some other places and sort of based her religion she was like a mystic. theology yeah on that you know so i guess she was like I thought a, that was like, kind of interesting like a, like a mystique and uh you know yeah I mean, even Jackson Pollock sort of, when he started painting, used some of the symbols and things that she was using in his works, you know. And I like abstract, and that's kind of what uh, a lot of the artists that they, he talked about, um, their works were abstract, so. Yeah. Um, uh, a lot of the artists I had heard of, except one guy I'd never, ever heard of, and... I don't remember his first name. His first name, first name started with an R, but his last name was Marsh. He and in the uh, 20s and 30s, he did the uh, the paintings of uh, New York City, the uh, the slums area, and uh, what they called the people who lived in the in the tenant buildings uh, called them uh, cliff dwellers. You know, it reminded him of uh, the uh, you know maybe the caveman periods, you know, living, living in high cliffs. <laughs> and his, the tenements. Yeah. That, that had to be a hard life. Absolutely. You know, and mostly there were the immigrants, you know, areas of, of New York city, you know, that uh, had a lot of, were tightly packed. And he did a lot of uh, paintings. I had never heard of that artist and I actually uh, liked, liked his style. I really liked his, uh, his his uh, illustrative uh, style. Something else that struck. Is that the one that got on the subway and rode around and was more like a voyeur and did the paintings? That was the uh, that was Hopper. That was that the, was Hopper. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he I was like the one that did the ones he he saw them as the one that did the um, fighting scenes and. Um, oh yeah, know, yeah. I'd never heard that. of him before either, and those yeah. were kind of cool, but they were very raw and. And yeah. showed a very base sort of uh, way of life in the city. Yeah, well, what, that was cool. Another thing that struck me that I didn't know about, a lot, a lot of these uh, artists, they started out as cartoonists and illustrators, you know, uh -huh. magazines and everything. And, of course, that skill, they developed that skill, their illustrative skill, and it, it you know, creeped into, you know, into their work. And, you know, I, I've... You know, no Norman Rock Rockwell and uh, James M. Flagg, and they were all you know illustrators. You know, in the beginning, but these guys, a lot of these guys, just about all of them, were uh, cartoonists and illustrators. Of course, back in the twenties and thirties, that's how an artist made a living. You know, for our, all the magazines and newspapers, and you know, and yeah, well, in the United States, there wasn't a whole lot of um, like art collectors and stuff like there was in Europe, so. You know, it was a different, um, you know, they had to do different kind of work to get money to, to you know, right. pay bills. So that's kind yeah. of where they went. Not even teachers, you know, because uh, I mean, there was a, during the Depression. So it was really a hard way to make a living trying to be an artist back then. Yep, it sure, it sure was. And uh, they, uh, uh, so it was interesting, you know, to me in that respect. Um, so what did you watch that? The, 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 what I, I thought it was a funny video myself. It struck me as funny. The uh, sec, second video about the story behind the Mona Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like that one too. That was really interesting because he started out, he really, you know, uh, put down the Vinci, you know, and he said that, you know, f um, for the longest time, you know, Da Vinci has been credited with, with being, you know, a scientist and a mathematician. And he said, the fact is, every single thing that he ever came up with invention was never made, was never put in, put into practice. Yes, his his works did influence, like the the military vehicles, like he came up with the idea of a tank, long 
before it was, you know, centuries later it was developed. And, but uh, he, what was, was interesting was uh, he wasn't such, while he was alive, he really wasn't such a big deal at all. I mean, he was pretty much ignored, <laughs> yeah, to a certain extent. But the, the painting of the Mona Lisa, of course, you know, famous. I actually, I have a, a replica copy of the Mona Lisa hanging on my wall right here, right to the left of me. I'm not going to take the camera and I'll show you, but <laughs> I was always fascinated by, you know, some people call it a smile. I call it more of a smirk. And uh, she looks at me and keeps me in line, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to actually see the Mona Lisa in, in France, so I was pretty lucky to see that. Yeah. Uh, I went to the Louvre and and went through a major portion of it. I've spent several days going through. I mean, you can spend several days going through the Louvre and not see it all. Sure. I'm sure. But uh, I was very lucky as a young young person to actually go and see a lot of paintings in the Louvre. So the Mona Lisa was one of the things I got to see. So. It was, it was, I was expecting this grandiose painting and it's this little, it's tiny, yeah. this little, I'm going, wow, that's a tiny painting. <laughs> and I, so I stood there and looked at it and I thought, wow, this replica, that's the Mona Lisa. The exact re replica, the dimensions, and they're only like uh, uh, 24 by 33 inches, something like that, you know, so it's, it's right. I mean, you're, I didn't realize it was even that big. Yeah, yeah, it's about yeah. That's that's the original size. But, of the um, thing. It comes up to like twenty four by thirty three or something like that. You know, it's an odd, you know, odd size. And but, you know, he said they said that he worked on it over time. So I mean, it just yeah, he would take forever to complete. In fact, that's how come he wasn't real popular when he was a working artist because they would he would get very few commissions because he had a reputation as having never completed. Yeah, he would never complete. He didn't finish a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he dragged around the Mona Lisa, what, about seven years, eight years, something like that, before he finally you know, <laughs> completed it. And I enjoyed the story, and they said the reason why we even have her today is is actually was because of the French Revolution, you know, which I didn't know. I didn't know that story. And when know? she got stolen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That's when the, everybody knew what it was. That's when her fame, yeah, her fame came about, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and in fact, we have the, the Louvre, uh, the Louvre uh, Fran uh, Museum because of the French Revolution, which is so, which is really contradictory because, you know, the French Revolution was, you know, destroying the autocracy. And during that time period, it was only the autocracy that had art that appreciated art, that committed, commissioned artists. Uh, if you didn't get a commission from a, you know, a prince or a duke or some member of the autocracy, then you were nobody. And then here, the, but at least they had enough sense to appreciate the art. That, to save know, it all, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they saved it all and, you know, and turned the Louvre into a national museum. And uh, then I love the story where Napoleon uh, actually stole the Mona Lisa and kept it in his bedroom for years and years and years before <laughs> it was finally taken back, you know, but still all this time, no one in the world knew about Mona, didn't know about Mona, you know, the Mona Lisa until that fell so 300 or 400 years or something like that before it really came. Yeah, yeah. It took her, it took her a long time years before she became famous when that Italian uh, managed to steal her. You know, and had it in his in uh, in uh, Florence, had it in his bedroom in Florence when they find he tried he made the mistake of. I've had work stolen. I've had the last time I moved, I had a box of paintings stolen. I mean, it's just really makes you angry, but it's I don't know. Well, it's, four hundred years. Weird. Four hundred years from now, they become famous. Okay. <laughs> so I, yeah, I kind of <laughs> wonder about that, but still. <laughs> When in Pensacola, Florida, I had a gallery still four paintings, and then I, I when I moved from Alabama to, to Alabama, I mean when I moved from northern central Alabama to South Alabama, I had about four or five paintings stolen. So I mean it's just like, <laughs> really, you, don't, you won't pay me for them, but you'll steal them. <laughs> you know, it's like 
okay. <laughs> I like when they said, you know, she really, I like uh, the uh, narrator. He said it took 400 years for her to become famous. <laughs> and now everybody knows who Mona Lisa is, you know, there's not a soul in this. Or even if you don't like art, you know who Mona Lisa is, you know, cause she's on everything. <laughs> Yeah, you can buy her on everything. Yeah, the and that was because she was stolen, and they had it so broadcast. You know, trying to find her, mm -hmm. that everybody was familiar with the painting by then. Yep, that's yeah. that kind Interesting. of That's why I found the story. You know, there is the internet now. I could post photos of the ones that were stolen, and it's like if you see this painting, know that it has been stolen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> try it, yeah. I, there's a couple that I never even got photographs of that were stolen. That, yeah, I see that. It was before. You, you got to have a good photograph <laughs> record, you know. <laughs> but I do have photographs of the last ones that were stolen. Yeah. Okay, with that, let's, uh, <laughs> let's, let's take a break for a message, and then we'll continue. Remember classic old-time radio? Old-time radio still lives at pulpradioart.com with Quiet Please, the thing on the Forble board. Quiet Please, the thing on the Forble board is a pulp radio art graphic novel inspired and based on the 1948 horror radio play. Utilizing an edited abridged version of the original script with Clyde's hand and digital illustrations, these scary, exciting stories will spark your imagination. Quiet Please, the Thing on the Forble Board is a true keepsake for the old time radio fan. Available in printed copy or ebook at pulpradioart.com. That's pulpradioart.com. Welcome back to the Artist Friends Podcast. You're listening to episode 59 for August 17, 2020. And I'm here with Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson. And we're discussing art history. Now, let me pose a question. Is it important to study art history? Diane, you want to take that? Hmm. <laughs> I think it is because it's, um, especially the older art, because it was used at a time when there were people, a lot of people didn't read, and um, it told stories to people without them being able to read. And, and a lot of them are um, depictions of things in history or from the Bible or um, just ways of the, of the way people lived and things that happened. And uh, there was a large segment of the population that didn't know how to read, so that was the only way of them finding out anything. But um, and I, and even today, though, the, a lot of the things that happened were – um, are depicted in art and even like my paintings I mean I'm, I paint mostly landscapes but I know I've done painted landscapes that where the, that landscape's no longer there now you know they've, they've mm -hmm. knocked the trees down and put housing developments in or whatever exactly. so it's a way of recording history that's um, different than a photograph would be it's more of the feelings and um, the attitudes of, of the day. So it's, it, I think it is really important. Constance, what about you? You, you think art, studying art history is important? Yes, I do think it's important. I mean, it's important to, to know past artists and their styles and, and uh, to just to learn from them, you know, because it helps you grow as an artist yourself, you know. Um. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we listen to quite a bit of Stefan Bauman, and he talks about how in the art schools are no longer, you know, they no longer teach the techniques of the great masters, you know. And just from that standpoint alone, uh, <laughs> studying art history, you study the, you look at the, the uh, masters and, uh, you study their uh, their whys and what for and their techniques of the painting, and it helps you, you know, become better a better painter. You know, and in all respects, regardless if you're doing representational art or if you're doing abstract, because even with abstract, you know, you still have to understand focal points and eye magnets and uh, 
composition, you know, standards. And you learn all that from, yes. you know, from studying, you know, art history and studying the masters. And to me, schools, from, of course, I never went to art school, so I can't speak from personal experience. But um, uh, I, too much of that, I think, is uh, is lost. You know, they're they're going through like uh, a period of, uh, of you know, you have to express how you feel. Well, <laughs> how do you do that <laughs> if you don't understand? You know, some con good composition principles, and you know, and, and lights and shadows, and uh, the uh, you know placement of uh, of eye magnets and uh, direction, and you know, and, uh, the you don't understand the golden mean, you know, and and uh, I mean the first time that Stephen Bauman talked about the golden mean, I just blew my just blew me away. I still don't understand it a hundred percent, but it blew me away that uh, you can look at nature and you can see the golden mean that it comes from nature. You know, and these uh, uh, artists, you know, the, the the great masters picked up on that and they understood that. You know, so so it's there's a lot to learn from studying older art. Um, I know when I was in college, we used to have to go to the museum and copy paintings. And when you really start looking deeply into the paintings and how they came up with um, the surface and how how they approach the subjects and things, you really learn a whole lot of more than just um, copying their brush strokes. I mean, it's like you you know really start picking it apart. You can really tell like all the compositional aspects and color. Um, relations and uh, there's there's just so many things that you can't see in a photograph yeah so and that's the catch a whole lot yeah so it's kind of like building blocks like you know you you can learn from them so you don't have to learn all the beginning stuff yourself like you know they they show you a certain amount of how to do things and that you can build on so it, it, it's important to learn like your basics too whether you um, they apply to the type of art you end up doing or not because it's kind of like you know the rules so then you know how to break them <laughs> you know right. it's, so it's it's interesting but yeah. and it kind of helps you maybe go in a direction you want to go I mean you know to help you I mean if you see an area you want to explore then you can explore it and then see if that's really where you want to go with your work or not, you know, until you start painting and experimenting with different styles of painting to get where you want to go with your own work, you know. And, so. and developing what they call the artist's voice, developing your voice, you know. Right, you know, for you your, know so. You know, so. The, well, a lot of art, you know, creating art, a lot of it is, is like a puzzle and you're trying to figure out how, to how best to depict something, whatever, whether it's something out of your head or it's something that you see. And if you can find another artist that's already done that or something similar to it and, and see how they solved that problem, then you can apply that to your own work and um, in your own way. But it just helps you um, get there faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I agree. Uh, studying art history is important. I myself, uh, along with studying the techniques and uh, the compositions and, and, and whatnot, uh, I enjoy the stories behind, you know, the artists and uh, how they came about, you know, to uh, create uh, that particular piece of work. Like I, you know, I thought that the video was fun, the funny story of the Mona Lisa, you know, I, you know, you, you uh, it kind of busted the myth of Leonardo da Vinci. You know, he's the world, he was world's great genius. When in reality, he really wasn't. You know, <laughs> it's that's been attributed to him. You know, over over the centuries. You know, <laughs> and uh, you know, as far as his production of his work, he really didn't produce that much work. Uh, Michelangelo was uh, far more productive. And I watched a documentary about Michelangelo once where he was, while he was a, uh, alive, he was a very successful artist. He was, he was very rich, a very rich art, artist because he had commissions from the uh, autocracy uh, all the time, 
you know, and he was always. Uh, That's because he finished things. <laughs> he finished, yeah. Yeah. And, and he was alive the same time. He was a great sculptor. Yeah, he was alive the same time as uh, Leonardo da Vinci, you know. In fact, they both worked for the uh, the same uh, uh, Florentine uh, duke, you know, and they also <laughs> both worked for the Medici family, you know, who were great, uh, you know, art uh, collectors and uh, commissioners of, you know, of artists. So uh, uh, I find that interesting. I re of course, I like history anyhow, so just – just pure enjoyment when I sit back back and watch an hour long or two hour long video talking about the, a particular artist, their life and the, you know, and their struggles and some things I can resonate with and some things not. Uh, the thing that depresses me is so many of them though, they ended up their life ended tragically. So many of them, you know, they, they're creating their art, drove them crazy. And I keep, you know, telling myself note to self, don't, <laughs> Go down that path, don't, don't, you know, because they end up committing suicide and, you know, and, or whatnot and drinking themselves to death or taking drugs and everything. Well, I think the large majority don't do that, though. I mean, I think they're, yeah. you know, they happen to be people that you hear about, but I don't think that's a majority. I think it's a minority that do that, you know, that go down that road. So, I, well, but, I, I mean, even back back in those in the old days they they didn't have cameras or um you know the only way they had of, of recording a scene or of people or whatever that was by getting you know an artist to paint it so you know that that's there's a lot of history in in paint in the older I, paintings especially there is a, a very i've heard of very many artists that a lot of artists, it's a very profitable business. I don't know if I could ever do it, but of artists that are actually going to like uh, weddings and birthdays and they're painting a la prima right, right there mm -hmm. you know, of the different yeah. you know, scenes <laughs> of the wedding, you know, and that's like a chic thing, you know, it's like, oh my God, I don't know if I could do that, but that's an interesting, <laughs> interesting side note, you know, an interesting. Plain air yeah. artists. <laughs> Yes, they're you know, you know, and, and capturing scenes of a you know of, of a uh, of a wedding. Yeah, if I did that, the mosquitoes would haul me away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I also asked you to pick your favorite American artist. It has to be dead, though, you know. And, and <laughs> you got your hand up. Who is your Who is your all time favorite American artist, and why? Come on now, you raise your hand. You raise your hand like you wanted to say something. Yeah. Uh oh, I got the deer in the headlights. Let me think of his name. Okay, uh, Jackson Jackson Pollock. Okay. And why is because I love his abstracts. He just was so free with his abstracts. He just, I hate it that he got pigeonholed, and. And instead of trying to come out of his pigeonhole, he did commit suicide in a way, you know, with his automobile. But um, I do like his abstracts. Yeah, he drank. He basically drank himself to death, and uh, that's it's a sad story yeah. of life. Yeah, yeah, he's one. He he's one of my one of my favorites too. But you know, it's hard for me to name you know ones. Um, he. Well, I have you know. I mean that's. That's one of one of my favorites. Now, just, I, for, I, for, I first became a, an aware of Jackson Pollock when I was in uh, grade school. When the, you know the in art class, other than making art, we uh, we had I don't know if grade schools do this now, but when I was in grade school, grade school, we had a great art teacher, and she would also show us films of you know of artists, and she showed a film of Jackson Pollock, you know, and how he. You know, made you know, uh, made his art, his drip style, you know, and everything. So when I got home, of course, my <laughs> uh -oh. I had to depend on my, on my mother, you know, to uh, provide paint. And mom couldn't couldn't afford, you know, regular oil paint sets, but she would buy these little uh, these little tins of oil that were samples of the local hardware store. They would, you know, she got them for free, you know. So I had multiple colors of basically it was house paint. 
I am. That's what Jackson was using. Yeah, I immediately when I went home, I had my canvas on the garage floor, and I <laughs> and I was going away. And she come in there. She said, "What well, the Sam? What are you doing?" I said, "I'm painting like Jackson Pally. I'm not buying you any more paint if you're just." Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I had a hard time convincing her that that was actual art. Yeah, the, the <laughs> famous artist who, who did. <laughs> <laughs> so, a very fond childhood memory of Jackson Pollock. Diane, who's I was, yeah, I was painting uh, abstracts when I was really young, and I got into trouble myself also. So, so <laughs> they're like, what the heck is that? <laughs> Diane, who's your, who's your fa uh, favorite? I don't know that I have a favorite. I, there's so many that I like. Um, but it's like the um, Hudson School painters. I, I like a lot of them guys. I guess mainly because they do the, I'm familiar with that area, um, spent a lot of time camping up in that area when I was younger. And um, so a lot of those, uh, the Hudson School painters I, I admire. And also Mary Cassatt was another one. I, I was trying to think of a lot of people that had died already. <laughs> so, was, But um, there's a lot of, there's, there were so many painters that I, you know, I do like that mm -hmm. I um, it's hard. It was hard to pick. Uh, I don't know if I can pick a favorite, a single favorite, but um, Mary Cassatt was interesting because she was an American, but she ended up going to France, and she befriended. Um, actually, she got into galleries over there, and uh, Degas, I think it was Degas, um, he looked, sought her out and invited her to become in, into the group with the Impressionists. And they didn't, she was the only person they ever did that to. And being a woman on top of it, it was kind of, you know, interesting because women weren't um, really accepted as being artists back then so much. Um, she was from an aristocrat, arist she, had, she, had, she was from a wealthy family and um, her parents weren't too happy about her going into the field of being an artist. <laughs> but... Uh, she she did all right with it, and um, she put her own spin on things. But she she did paint more um, impressionistic. Mm -hmm. But um, some of her work though was huge, like a lot. Of, well, she did a lot of paintings of kid children and women and stuff. But she did one um, a mural that was like eighteen feet high and fifty eight feet long or something. It was huge. Really? Yeah. It was, humongous <laughs> like men wouldn't even do that <laughs> back then so and she because she wouldn't get on ladders and stuff she um worked on it in her studio and then had it transported to where they ended up hanging it so uh women you know had to work a little differently because they weren't allowed to do certain things it wasn't lady like to be climbing up ladders and <laughs> yeah stuff like that <laughs> Out in public, especially, so she had a she had a they rolled it and unrolled it so she could work on the different parts of the painting and be able to do it from. This has a lot of plates yeah. in it, but it doesn't say how big the paintings are. Yeah. Well, yeah, but there's, there's a lot of painters I admire, like the way they they work. And yeah. The thing, you know, the materials yeah. they have to use. Yeah. I mean, we have we're lucky because we have, our, you know, we are our access to. The art materials so much better than what they had to work with. Oh, just yeah. the paint quality yeah. alone is a, is just they had to make something else. Paint, you know, a lot of times back then, they even had to yeah, grind in their own paints. Employ mm -hmm. people, to, you know, to. That's what I'm saying. The paint quality alone is something else. <clears throat> yeah. You know, just being able to buy a tube of paint in a paint color of your choice that's not some kind of dull, dull color that's you know like a a magenta, quinacrinone magenta or something like that. They didn't have that back then. Yep. Yeah, it's, I'm the same way. There are so many American artists that uh, I admire. Uh, I like their work. There's not, I've never been in a situation where I wanted to necessarily paint like, but I know that they've had uh, influence on, you know, on my work. Going back to the you know the early you know twenties and thirties, I have a tendency to admire more of the illustrative you know type artists. Uh, James M. Flagg, who was you know an illustrator, he's famous for doing the, the Uncle Sam 
you know, poster. And that, that's his most famous piece. And, you know, he did a lot of posters in support of World War One, And then uh, later, later on. And what's interesting is he uh, taught in several schools. And many of the later famous illustrators learned from him. Norman Rockwell studied in, under James, uh, James M. Flagg and uh, many others that uh, were, uh, you know, in later life became famous. And uh, the one artist I admire his work because he has such a profound influence on me when I was very, very young. And I've mentioned before is Thomas Hart Benton, you know, as American artist from Missouri. He, uh, during uh, the 20s and 30s, during the Depression, you know, um, his, a lot of his work, is uh, in uh, Capitol buildings and universities. It, he did these very large murals and very uh, Americana, very, uh, he, you know, his late in the later years, criticized that his work was, was presented too much of a uh, mushy image of America, you know. But uh, his one critic even commented on a film I watched, even commented that he didn't know how to draw. Well, I'm sorry. When I see his work, uh, he, he he knew how to draw. And one of the documentaries that uh, when he would, uh, in preparation of a mural, a large mural painting with figures, you know, uh, in it, he would make, uh, he also studied the masters and he studied uh, Titian quite a bit, the Italian artist Titian. And he would make clay models of his figurines and then light them so that he could get the proper shadow and lighting when he created his large murals, mural paintings. And um, that, you know, when I discovered that, that amazed me. You know, he would spend spend days and weeks and months creating all of these clay models before he'd even pick up the paintbrush. And, of course, he made his own paint out of, you know, it was a... Um, out of uh, egg and his tempera, you know, tempera style, you know, style paint. So oftentimes in his early career, uh, he would uh, get a commission and would only get paid the price of the eggs, what it costs to, you know, to, to buy the <laughs> eggs and, you know, to make the paint, you know. And uh, so, uh, and of course he was cantankerous. You know, I've mentioned him before, you know, he very much was uh, anti-art. Uh, the uh, art critics and the uh, hoity toities he ticked them off. Yeah. <laughs> but it, what impressed me was he has a very large mural in the uh, university of Indiana in, in one of their uh, lecture halls. And uh, our school took a field trip. I remember very vividly. And we went and visited that mural. And of course I was, you know, interested in art, always enrolled in art class, you know, all the way through grade school. And, I don't know, maybe I was 10 years old, 11 years old, I think, when we went and visited that, you know. And I was just blown away as to how immersive, you know, how big and everything. And I used to say to myself, God, if I could only paint like that, if I could one day only paint like that. I've never been able to uh, make an attempt to even begin to paint like Thomas Hart Benton, but I understood very much I studied quite a bit of his art and I understand his style. And, uh, so he ha he's had an influence when I do figure paintings, just like, you know, I like Caravaggio. He's not an American artist, but Caravaggio has an influence on my artwork. And, uh, uh, I can name off a dozen more of American artists that I, I admire, you know, and it all comes back to what we mentioned earlier, the importance of art, of study and art history, you know, because that's how you learn about these artists, you know, and you've got YouTube and the internet at your fingertips, you know, folks to, uh, to learn and, uh, you know, learn, learn about these artists and everything. So let's, uh, let's wrap this episode up. I think we got a little bit longer than normal and you've been listening to the artist friends podcast episode 59. Before we go, we all made, we made a commitment set a goal so how many of us got our goal done and let's raise our hands <laughs> not very many hands going up <laughs> there's, only, there's only two hands going up Diane, <laughs> Diane.
Diane's the one that didn't get anything done. Of course, she has excuses. <laughs> Let's work on a farm and have. Well, a- I didn't. I didn't get all of mine done. Well, you got part of the goal done. I didn't get all mine. I think I said three or four, and I only got two done myself, you know? So, what, you said you only did two, right, Constance? So Yeah, I thought I was going to paint every day, and I was not able to paint every day. Okay. <laughs> but Diane didn't get any painting done, at least. Yeah, Diane, I was busy Diane. distracting, honey. Yeah. I had yeah. to get that done. But that, that's, uh, yeah, that's why we hold life it. On, life on the farm. So before we wrap this up, and Constance has promised me to send me photos, and I also yes. have photos of the work, so we can put it on the uh, YouTube version of this podcast, so our listeners can go and yeah, you know, take a look at some of our work. And what's going to be our goal for next week? Want to do the same thing? Work, on, make yeah. a, make a promise to do some paintings. Yeah. Except for we won't we won't give a a, a specific number this time. We'll just. <laughs> a painting at least one at least one painting well i need to set a higher goal so that i will get so you at least some of it done (laughs) a higher goal so you're a fail right (laughs) no if i set a higher goal then i at least achieve 80 percent of it (laughs) or if not if not a completed painting a uh a work in progress painting now that's good enough just just so so that we show our listeners that we are active working artists. So we're we're uh, yeah we're working at our craft. So how about that, Diane? You gonna try that again this this week? Yeah, I should be able to get that get something done or at least started. Okay, and <clears throat> always make sure you send me the photographs so I can you know post post it for our listeners on our on the uh, podcast version. So let's wrap up this episode of the Artist Friends Podcast episode 59 for august the 17th 2020 and you've been listening to diane hunt constant bronson and clyde J. Gale talk about art history and why it's important and our favorite artists and i'm going to say goodbye to diane and constance goodbye you two good night <laughs> good night clyde good night constance good night everyone good night clyde good night diane good night everybody Good night, everyone. And as always, please, however you hear this podcast, give us a thumbs up. Send us comments. Give us a star rating. Let us know that you enjoy this. Give us some love. We're lonely working artists. We need some love. (laughs) Good night, everybody. The Artist Friends Podcast is produced and edited by Clyde J. Kale. Participating artists, Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson and Clyde J. Kale. You can find more information about Diane Hunt at www.dianehuntstudio.com. Constance Bronson at www.edsy.com forward slash shop forward slash C-B-R-O-S-N-A-N-S. Clyde J. Kale at www.cjkaleartworks.com. If you would like to participate or appear as a guest on the Artist Friends Podcast, please email cjkale at sign mystery-otr.com. If you enjoy these podcasts, please give us a thumbs up or star rating. And most of all, send us your comments. This podcast is issued under the Creative Commons license.